Yeah, so this morning we are going to continue our James series. The title of this message is Tame the Untamable. As I said uh, earlier, uh, this whole passage is about how to use our tongue, how to, how to use our words in a way that pleases God and reflects who Christ is. Our passage today is really about this, this how, how, you know, how our, our use of our tongue as followers of Jesus Christ and what comes out of our mouth actually matters more than we think. We talk a lot, don't we? Our words actually reveal what our deepest desire is, what kind of person we are, and even how we have lived. When we, when we hear someone speaks, we don't really hear the words that this, this person is speaking, right? We hear more about this person, who this person is, the personality, the character, so much more information than just the word that this person is speaking. But not only that our words reveal who we are, they can also be used to build, encourage, or even save other people. Just like how Talia went out to the nation, preached the gospel, and this soul accepting Jesus Christ, that's how we can use our tongue to preach the good news, to literally to save these people. But on the other hand, of course, we can also, you know, through our careless words sometimes that we can also curse and destroy and hurt and give pain and totally destroy the souls of others, pierce them with our words. How we are going to use our tongue matters. It is more spiritual than we think, actually. And this is why we need to learn how to use it, how to tame it. If you remember, that's also what James said earlier in chapter 1. He said, if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but, dece- but deceives his heart, this person's religion is what? It's worthless. That's the, we have the slide for that. It's worthless. And this is a very radical statement. If you don't know how to use our tongue, how to bridle our tongue, if you don't really have a control over our words, then all the claims that we are, okay, we, I, I love Jesus, I believe in Christ, that all of those things, all of our religion, all of our faith is what? Worthless. It's a radical, radical, radical statement. If we do not care about what we speak and how we speak, our faith in Christ is worthless. Why? Because there is this spiritual connection between our words coming out of our mouth and our hearts. There is this connection. Even Paul said that our salvation depends on our verbal confession of our faith in Jesus Christ. It's interesting. If you look at Romans 10, verses 8 to 10, Let's read this together, actually. One, two, three. But what does he say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. You can clearly see in this verse, in this passage, that our verbal confession of our faith is a necessary ingredient for our salvation, not just our hearts, not just our hearts. You know, we sometimes say or think like, well, as long as you believe in Jesus in your heart, you don't, you don't actually need to tell anyone that you, you, you do, you know. God knows your heart and you're saved. Well, based on this passage, that's wrong. You got to confess it. And that's, I think that's also related to the whole purpose of why we get baptized. There is this inseparable com- uh, um, connection between our confession of faith and our faith, our believing, I mean, believing with our heart. I think this is also related to the concept of work and faith that Pastor Jason explained last week, that when we speak out what we believe, that's when there is this unification work that connects our hearts with our confession. Our confession, our speech completes what we believe. 
that we become what we believe when we speak it out and make a statement. Faith is not just about what you believe in your heart personally, but also what you speak out publicly and verbally according to this passage. To have the unification of your body, of your mind, of your soul, and of your spirit all together. All together. Just like how last week, as you saw, the faith and works, you know, they have to be unified in order for the faith to be perfectly genuine. Same, same, I guess the same way that our words, that our action and our, our, and our heart, what, what, what we believe in our heart, they have to be unified. And that's the importance of using our tongue. What we speak is intertwined with what we believe. And what we believe is also intertwined with who we are. That's how important it is to know how to use our tongue. And this is why we need to listen to James in our passage today, showing us how to use our tongue, how to tame our tongue. And I have divided our passage into five parts. If you uh, look at the slide there. In our passage, James talks about first, the accountability of the tongue, the power of the tongue, the nature of the tongue, the use of the tongue. and the source of the tongue. So first, we're going to talk about the accountability of the tongue. James says in verse 1 to 2, he says, Now many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to, also to bridle his whole body. The first reason why we need to be careful in what we say is because we will be held accountable for everything that we say. Every single word that comes out of our mouth, God's going to hold us accountable for that. That's why exactly Jesus said, if you look at Matthew um, chapter 12, he says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word. That's next slide. Every careless word they speak, for by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will, you, you will be condemned. This is what Jesus said. And it's mind-blowing because, wow, <laughs> I mean, we don't even remember what we, I mean, can, can you remember like everything that you have spoken in your lifetime? Well, Jesus does. God does. And we have to give account for every word that speaks out of our mouth before God on that day of judgment. It means that the creator of the universe is watching every single word that comes out of our, our, our mouth. Yes. A little bit intimidating, we might say. Like, ha. Huh. That we will be judged based on what we have said during our lifetime that God is going to hold us accountable for every careless word that we spoke. And this is because what we speak, like the reason why God cares so much about what we speak is because our speech has so much power and affects ourselves and also affects others. I think this is why James says that not many of us should become teachers. There will be greater strictness for those who speak more, James said, especially for people who teach others. There can be some selfish ambition or immature motive that I want to become a teacher, I want to be a leader, I want to be a pastor even, I don't know. I want to be this person who speaks to people. Well, in a context of faith community, there will be a greater accountability and responsibility for those who speak and lead. Huh. And knowing this, I have seen how people react. I mean, some people would say that we don't need to distinguish teacher because this burden is too heavy. So, um, you know, we can just be all teachers, all leaders. Um, and I think that's also linked with this postmodern idea, right? This 
idea that every opinion that we make is valid. Um, like in our culture today, we cannot say that something is wrong because everyone, in postmodern idea, everyone becomes gods. And everyone's viewpoint, everyone's perspective matters, and we have to honor that. And it's really hard to say that someone is wrong. That attitude is not acceptable in our culture. And I think we bring that in to our community sometimes. I think that's a lot of church do, to be honest. Because of course, what's happening in the world is always what's happening in the, in the church. So I think one of the examples for that is, you know, if you, um, if you see how people do Bible study these days, you know, just look at them, how they, how, how they do Bible study, you know, in the fellowship setting, in the small groups, to look at them, how they lead Bible study. Well, I know how, to, I know how many Christians do these days is that, we open up the text, we gather around the text, and we share about how we feel, how we think about certain verse. And then we say, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. My point is also good. We're, we have all the good points. Thank you for expressing yourself. And time's up. Time to go home. There's no conclusion, no objective truth, only subjective feelings and thoughts, and we're so happy and satisfied with it. We're happy that, well, this person expressed himself or herself, we're good with it. And we call that as a Bible study. That's not a Bible study. That's not a Bible study. Why? Because literally, the word Bible study means what? Studying the Bible. But what, what, but what we do many times these days is that we, yes, we have the Bible, so it's, it's very sneaky, and he it, it, it might seem like, seems like a Bible study, right? Well, we have a Bible at the center, and then we talk about the Bible in, in some way, but what's really happening in that moment is that we're not talking about the Bible. We're talking about ourselves, how we feel about this verse. So it's not Bible study. It's me self-study. I'm studying about myself. I'm very interested in myself, my view how I feel about this certain verse. And I'm so happy with my view, my perspective. So praise me or compliment me, approve me. That's what we do many times in these days. So it, it, is, so, it is so mind-bothering for, for, you know, you know, to see that because it's really not the Bible study. It's just studying about ourselves. Bible study is we open up the text, we look at this verse, and we use all of the supporting materials to understand, you know, by taking account all the literary context, historical context, all the theological knowledge to really understand what this verse means. And that has nothing to do with about how I feel about it, right? This, this verse has its original objective meaning that does not change by how I feel about it. But a lot of times, these days I see among many churches, that's how we lead Bibles, how we teach Bible. Why? Why? First of all, that's so much easier. Why? If you don't say that something is right, then you don't need to offend anyone. If you don't say that something is wrong, in the same way, you don't need to offend anyone. You know, you say that, well, answer is subjective, and what works for you is the final answer. As long as you do that, you're not going to make anyone being offended or make this time awkward. But if we keep on doing that, if we keep on approving people for what they believe and never correcting them, never showing them the way, then what we are actually cultivating is when they go out into the world, and they even just approve for everything that they believe, they think. And they go out into the world, and they face some situation. They look at this social movement. They look at how, I mean, the pattern of this world, and how, how their friends are thinking. And they have no way to distinguish or discern what is right or what is wrong. Why? Because they've never told what is 
right or what is wrong about how they think or believe. This is why so many Christians these days, especially, especially people living in this culture, they, they, have, they have a very unclear understanding about who God is and how to respond to certain situations and issues of our society. Well, as teachers of the Bible, if you are a leader, if you are a pastor, if you are a teacher that teaches the Bible to people, shares his word to someone, we need to understand based on this word of James today that God's going to hold us accountable for what we say. Meaning, if we are afraid of offending people, upsetting people, if I say this as it is, objective truth, if I just give this Bible in a raw way, raw to them, then I know that I'm going to upset people. Well, if that is why we're not really speaking out, voicing out the, the true meaning of the verse, the, the text, then God's going to hold us accountable. In fact, if you remember what Apostle Paul said in Galatians in chapter 1, he clearly said in a very, I think it's the strongest way that he can use in the Bible. He said that if you, if you or other teachers or even the angels preach a different gospel, let him be accursed. Like that's the strongest expression of how bad it can be. That God's going to, if I preach a different gospel to you, I will be accursed. God's going to hold me accountable for everything that I said, and I have to be held accountable for that. So, so we got to choose between this, okay, fear of the Lord or fear of man. There's no third way. Okay, are, are we going to actually be faithful to the text, preach this as it is? And I, we don't know, we don't have a control over how people will react, but I'll be faithful to, the text, to, to, to this text and preach it and teach it. Are we going to choose that path? Or are we going to always dilute this text that, yeah, it can also mean that way. So listen, look at me. Let me say this clearly to all of you. Not everyone's opinion is right. There is right and wrong. There is objective truth that does not change by how we think, we feel, whether we approve it or not. It does not change that God is God. And his word becomes true, and his word stays true no matter what happens, how I feel about it. And the teacher's job in the faith community, including myself, is to teach with boldness what that objective truth is, whether it will upset people or not. If you as a teacher keep diluting the meaning of the text, make it politically correct, make sure what you speak will please everyone, you're not a true teacher. You're not. You're not actually sharing God's word. You're sharing your thoughts about God's word. And you're letting this person to speak about his or her thoughts about the Bible. Well, that might be, of course, that might be a part of a really good Bible study too, of course. But that shouldn't be the only thing that we should talk about. Our job is not only about facilitating discussions and let's just all talk about it. That's not our job as teachers. We gotta show what the objective truth of God says. And of course, in gentleness, love, and sensitivity, but also boldly and transparently. If we keep validating everyone's opinion and we, we, we never say that, okay, that, sorry brother, but that view that you have you need to actually correct your view a little bit because, because that's not what the Bible says. If we don't do that, then the truth of God becomes what? Just one of the opinions that we share. Like that's what the Bible says, but this is how, how I think, and that's what that person says. And, it just, and this word just becomes one of the many opinions that we can choose to believe or not. 
If we don't give people a clear worldview, a biblical stance to understand and interpret what's going on in the world, I mean, if, 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 if we don't give them a clear worldview, then, then they don't know how to interpret or understand what's going on in the world. If they have not been told that they're wrong in any way, they will not be able to distinguish what is wrong in the world. Of course, it is not only about the teachers, of course. I also want to speak to you. As a congregational member, you need to humbly accept that you can be also wrong and your opinion can be totally unbiblical sometimes. That you need to learn how to drop your pride and listen. It is also, I believe, congregational responsibility to nurture good and faithful teachers. Why? Because you, if you as a congregation only accept the teachings that are pleasing to, your, to pleasing to your ears, then those faithful, good, and faithful um, Bible teachers will not actually survive here because they will be, what? Persecuted, unappreciated, and disrespected. That we do not welcome these teachings if we keep saying then those teachers will not survive. James says, for we all stumble in many ways. You, are, you and I are not always right. What, 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 I mean, the reality is that what we speak out of our mouth, there's a lot of mistakes that we make, right? Sometimes we speak something and then we, we can see this word penetrating through the, through the air. We're like, oh, you know, it's kind of too late. I kind of want to grab it, you know? I know how like in a, in a, in a messenger's these days, we sometimes have this uh, like unsend setting and you know, that 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 function. I mean, how easy how 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 easy it would be, right? Sometimes we definitely regret about what we said. So James says, "For we all stumble in many ways. Sometimes our teachers also make errors. Leaders also make errors. But that's why we need the objective truth of God, not my perspective, my thoughts, and your thoughts." Let's talk about, not, no, let's talk about how God thinks and his objective truth. And that's the true Bible study. That's the true way of teaching his word. And a good Bible teacher is someone who knows that he or she will be held accountable. Thus, having the fear of the Lord, faithful to his truth ready to face all the consequences of his preaching and speech. That can be persecution. That can be disrespect. That can be people slandering you, gossiping about you. I know that there is a cost to pay to be faithful. And I, including myself, I want, to invite in, I want to invite all of you, all of us, to walk in the hard path. The path that we can be faithful to God, not to people, not to the world. Because as we worship this morning, the race, the race will be finished and we will be held accountable to God for how we lived and what we spoke, how we taught so if you look at your pastors and teachers, this is also the reason why you need to pray for them instead of giving a criticism. Because you know what? Even without your criticism, they will be held, held accountable to God anyway. Look at them with the eyes of mercy. Pray for them. I mean... Just hearing about all these things, do you think anyone would want to do this? Like, okay, I stumble in many ways. I know that I'm, 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 I'm imperfect, but God is saying that, okay, God is going to hold me accountable for every word that I speak. Do you think anyone would want to do this? The only reason that pastors do this work is because of God's calling. It's not because you want to do this work. So pray for them. Pray for your pastors and your teachers, that they would walk in this path of righteousness, that they will be bold and faithful to God's teaching. The second part of the text is on the power of the tongue. The reason why there's a, so much accountability and responsibility 
for the use of our tongue is because there's so much power in it. If you look at verse 3 to 5, it says, If we put bits into the mouth of horses, so they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they, are also, though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set blazed by such a small fire. Just like how in the faith community, one teacher can influence the whole congregation by what he speaks, there is a power in our words that quickly spreads and can influence many people. Just like how God created the whole world with his word. There's a divine power in our words as people who are made in his likeness. So much power in, 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 in our speech that our words can quickly spread and influence many, many people. And James uses three analogies here, horse, sheep, and fire. The common thing between horse and sheep, first of all, is that they are more powerful than humans, than us. No, more bigger, more powerful, yet they can be controlled by putting bits into the mouth of the horse and also by a very small rudder. It shows how our tongue, a small member of our body, can control our whole body and our entire life. Not only that, our words are like the wildfire that spreads so quickly. Remember how our gossips spread so quickly, like it's so fast, so juicy, juicy gossip, <laughs> it spreads so quickly. Just like how forest is set, set a place by such a small fire. This is why the first thing that communists did in history in order for them to brainwash people and take over the land is by taking away the freedom of speech because they know once they take away our freedom of speech, that we lose the ability of speak in certain way or certain things, then we lose the ability of, to think. Because as I said, when we speak our mind, that's what we know, that's, that's when we know what we know. That's when our souls and body become one. When I make a statement that I'm a cyclist, then I know that hmm, I am a cyclist. Huh. I didn't know this. No? When I say that I'm a student, who are you? I'm a student. That's, that gives you identity. And communists in history exactly know the power of our speech and they take it away from people, just like North Korea. They exactly have certain things that they cannot say unless they want to die. Because once people lose the ability of speak their mind, they lose the ability of think. And once they lose the ability of, to, to think, they don't know what they're thinking. So they need to depend on someone else to think for themselves. They cannot think on their own. And that's how the brainwashing starts. As Christians, we have the freedom of speech. In fact, we're called to speak our minds in, 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 in guidance of God's truth. But James said, just like how in the previous verse we saw, that we need to use our freedom well in a responsible way that our words will build, encourage, and save other people. He's telling us to use his power well in a God-pleasing and positive way. And the reason why we need to be intentional in doing this is because our tongue, our words, our tongue is inherently evil, and, 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 and it, is not, it, it is not neutral. And that's what he's talking about in the, in the next part. So verse um, 6 to 8, there's a third part of the text. It's about the nature of the tongue. James says, and The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. A tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and is set on fire by hell for every kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea creatures can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Here, James is not explaining the tongue as if it is a neutral thing. Just like technology, we say that, oh, technology is, is a neutral thing. It depends on how you use it. Well, 
He's not explaining it in that way at all. He's saying that it is an evil, restless evil. It is set on fire by hell. It's very strong words here that he's using. Well, it is true, right? If, you, if, if we think about how we use our tongue and when we look at ourselves, our tongue is not neutral. You know, gossiping is always more fun and easier. We don't need to learn. We don't need to go to a school of gossip and like, oh, this is how you gossip about certain people in a very effective way. We don't do that. It just comes naturally out of us. But to encourage someone, to like give someone an encouragement, like positive impact to someone, that requires training, right? That requires training, a practice. That doesn't come naturally out of us. That requires a lot of character formation and knowing how to build someone with our words. The reason why is it is our tongue is inherently evil is because it is linked with our sinful nature. As just like how we cannot tame perfectly our sinful nature completely, uh, in the same way we cannot tame our tongue completely. James quickly concludes here in our passage is there is no human being who can tame the tongue. It is restless evil, full of deadly poison. The nature of the tongue, our, our tongue, is linked with our sinful nature. So here's a dilemma, because we are called to tame the untamable. Right? James says that no human being can tame the tongue. But at the same time, well, you got to tame the tongue. <laughs> you got to bridle your tongue, he says. So here's a dilemma. Here's a paradox. We're called to tame this untamable tongue, this unquenchable fire, but we have no ability to put off the fire. We try our best, but use of our tongue often entails like this. Look at the next verse. Uh, look at the next part of the text to find how we use our tongue. Verse nine to say, um, verse nine to ten says, "With it we bless our Lord and Father." With our tongue, he means. And with it, we curse people and who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers. These things are not to be so. We can use our tongue in radically different ways as we see in this verse. Proverbs also said, The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Our tongue can be used to pierce someone's soul but it can also be used to bring healing. It can be used in a extremely radically different ways. We often hear people committing suicide because of some depression, which is often due to some words they heard at some point in their life that, that pierced their souls. and They would never be able to get out of the pain. Because of the words. We can see this paradox in Christian life. We sing beautiful songs to Jesus, yet at the same time, from the same mouth, we curse people who are made in God's image, according to James. It's like we love our Father God, but we don't really like His children. So let's say if you come to me and then you confess to me in a very gentle and loving way that, Jay, I love you, but I hate Theo then I'm not going to be like, I'm not going to be like, oh, I feel so loved. Thank you so much. I'm not going to be like that, of course. Because it doesn't make sense. How can you like me and then hate my son? That does not make sense. But yes, that's us. We keep on doing that does not make sense. All of us, all of us in this room, are in this paradox because of our sinful nature. And James comes in and tells us, it shouldn't be like that. you got to deal with it and change it. But we say, how? You just said that it's impossible. <laughs> and James leads us to the answer in the final part of this text. Verse 11 to 12 says, Does a spring pour forth from the same opening 
both fresh and salt water. Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. This is the key to the mystery of how we can tame the untamable fire, which is our tongue. Maybe not completely or perfectly, but over time, we are growing and we get better at it. But this is how we start. Through James's words in verse 11 to 12, James is showing us there is a source of our tongue. Source. A root of our words. He's using this analogy of a spring that contains water. Fresh water comes from a fresh spring. Salt water comes from a salty spring. I mean, that's, of course, fresh air, fresh air is also translated as sweet, and salt water here also translated as bitter. So if you taste some bitter water, it means that the, 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 the spring that contains this water is also bitter. So what is the source of our tongue or our words then? Jesus gives us the answer. He said, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. What comes out of our mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. Jesus clearly gives us the answer that the source of our tongue is our heart. Heart. Therefore, to tame the bitterness of our words, yeah, if everything we speak, we feel like, okay, I'm just speaking a lot of bitter words, and it means that my heart is full of bitterness. So to tame our tongue, we need to tame our heart. Just having more self-consciousness that you know, have more self-consciousness about what we speak is not the answer. Dealing with the root, the source, the spring of our heart is what we need to deal with. So how can we make our heart from bitter to sweet? Living in this world surrounding by these endless sufferings and struggles, sometimes surrounded by the wrong people, slandering you. Sometimes you can also experience your closest friends betraying you. Sometimes it can even be your family. That happens over and over again. No wonder. I fully understand that you can't feel bitter. I feel bitter so many times. Why, why, why is this happening? Why is my life like this? And why, even in relation to God, why did God allow this and that and that? And no wonder. No wonder we can feel bitter. And when, we, when our hearts are bitter, we try not to say anything bitter things. Of course, we try so much, but we know that our words are genuine. Our words will be sharp and cut and destroy whoever we speak with, especially our closest people that we love. But we've got to break the cycle and receive the healing. What we need for transforming our heart is not only a, only a discipline, it's a healing. It's a healing. The healing starts when we truly receive the gospel of Jesus Christ, the power of his blood, the power of his cross. Let's look at this verse, uh, and, uh, and, and, and I'll conclude this message. Let's look at this passage, 1 Peter chapter 2. For this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. 
When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. In, in, in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And look at this. Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. All of our bitterness. All of our failures. That we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And watch this for all of you who want to receive healing from Christ, healing from God. Watch this next part. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you are straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Do you not get your heart to be healed? Look at Jesus, the crucified Christ. Don't turn your head away. Don't look at him for five seconds and turn it. No, no, no. Just look at him intently. Look at him right now. Look right at him. He's pierced hands. Look at it. His crown of thorns, people betraying him, slandering him, and, not, and wanting him to vanish and die. Look at his face on the cross. Look into his eyes. Look at the blood that's flowing. All these things are for you and for us. By his wounds, we have been healed. Only this gospel can change our hearts deeply. Only by knowing that someone else went through the exact same bitterness that you are going through right now. And that was for you. Only by accepting that, only by embracing that true beauty of the gospel, we can be healed. Where sin abounds, the grace abounds all the more. Where there is seemingly untamable fire, untamable bitterness, there is a greater fire that sw swallows that up the greater fire, fire of God's love, his burning love which is demonstrated on the cross of Jesus Christ. That's what we need. Daily, every day, we look intently at the cross. When we feel bitter by people's betrayal, we look at Jesus' life, how he was betrayed. When we feel bitter about not being loved, accepted, we look at Jesus Christ, how he's rejected countless times. When we feel bitter because we feel lonely, we look at Jesus Christ, how he was left alone at the end of his life on the cross. And there, we become unified with Christ through the wounds. And that's worship. And that's how the prayer starts. That's how we come to love him in a genuine way. That Lord Jesus, you know, and you're the only one, and you're the only one that can heal me. So at this time, I want to invite the worship team to come up. Let's all rise. Let's respond to God this morning. <laughs>